and I hope everybody's doing well today. Um, it's a topic that I love to talk about because it's such a um, eyelid surgery or even injections around the eyes using fillers is a very good way to take years off your face because the eyes are the first area, um, actually even before the neck, to start aging us and people notice sometimes they notice their lower face their neck that bothers them but their eyes really give away their age more than the lower face and neck because most of us when we greet our um, greet ourselves to other people who are new or to even uh, those who we see uh, they are looking at our eyes first when they address us or talk to us so the eyes like they say are the windows to your soul and it is uh, one of the the biggest things that gives us gives away our age so i'm going to be talking about that today all right so it's uh past uh five minutes past the hour so i'm going to get started here on this uh, webinar today so i'm going to start by just giving you some information about eyelid surgery and anatomy behind the eyes or around the eyes uh, and what happens as we age so before I begin, I'm going to just uh, share my screen so you can see uh, what I'm showing you today. So this is the presentation. Okay, so I hope that you guys can see this. I'm going to just go ahead and share the screen here. So um, a little bit about myself. I'm Dr. Christina Tanzavati, and I'm in Westlake Village, California. And today I'm talking about eyelid surgery as well as other options to address the eyes non-surgically. Uh, so uh, I, um, my practice here is I'm in solo practice in Westlake Village, California. I'm a facial plastic surgeon and my focus is um, there's three main surgeries that I focus on, and that is facelift surgery, eyelid surgery, and rhinoplasty. Those are my three top surgeries uh, that I enjoy doing and I, um, I love talking about. So today we're talking about eyelid surgery. I'm going to give a little outline. Um, so the aging eye uh, is what I'm going to talk about first because uh, in order to understand, though, the, how the eye starts to age, we have to understand how it looks like when we're young and how it looks like when we're old and what changes occur in between that time period. Then I'll talk about the difference between fillers versus surgery and when fillers are appropriate and when surgery is a better option for my patients. And then the reasons to pursue surgery. And then with the end, I'm going to give a summary. So. Let's start off with talking about the aging eye, and I hope all of you can see this screen. So let me know if you can't see this clearly. Uh, so the aging eye, if you see the difference between the two sides, this is just to give you a depiction of what happens to the eye as we age. So one of the things that can happen, I'm gonna just address the upper eyelids first. In a youthful eye, and I'm just point out the youthful eye on the left side, you can see the volume that uh, occurs, that is present uh, in and around the brow and in and around the eyelid itself. And you've got a crisp uh, upper eyelid crease that you can see that goes away as we age. The skin also starts to thin. So then if you look then on this right side, the skin of the upper eyelid starts to thin and becomes saggy and it starts to sit right over our lashes. So the space that's very nice and crisp, that crease goes away, and the space between the crease and the upper eyelid margin or the lashes also goes away. So what we see is the eye looks tired and droopy. So it's not well framed. And that's what we're looking for. I'm always looking for trying to get the contour and frame of the eye to where it used to be. The lower eyelids, same thing that can happen, although you can't see so much on this picture, I'll show in a different picture, but the difference between the lid and the cheek 
is not well seen. So there's not in the young picture on the left, there is no um, distinction between the eye and the cheek. They just run into each other. But on the right side, you see that there is some bags showing. And then you see sort of a crease that shows below the eye between the eye and the cheek. So these contour irregularities was what our eyes are drawn to. When we're young, we see nice curves. When we're older, we see abrupt depressions and then a, another contour and then another depression. And that is what gives us that sense that, okay, this person is older. And so what we can do is we can soften those transitions between the lower eyelid and the cheek. And that's what we do with either eyelid surgery or fillers. This is a telltale sign of a upper eyelid um, looseness. Not only the skin also sags, so you can see that on the outside, but in the inner corner, this is what we call the A-frame deformity. And that um, distinction as we age is not that the, like in the last picture you saw, the skin got looser and it started to fold over. In those patients who lose volume, which can happen as well, you can have both those occur, the skin become loose, becomes loose, as well as volume starts to de uh, actually increase, our bone around our eye, our orbit, expands and it decreases the bony thickness. And so the volume of our eye actually increases and it retracts back. So our eyes start to uh, um, drop back and they look uh, they look hollow. Um, and so that's what's going on. So you lose volume instead of actually the volume sinks per se in the upper eyelids, it's, it, um, it retracts back. And so that's what you see as an A-frame deformity. So that gap between the upper eyelid and the brow area and that crease goes up. And so we can address an A-frame deformity with fillers, uh, but we can't address the sagging skin with fillers. And so that's when, if we put volume here to address this A-frame deformity, you'll still have loose skin and actually even more loose skin. So then that needs to be addressed. So that's the only, that, that part with the upper eyelid has to be addressed with surgery. There really isn't any non-surgical option other than maybe to tighten the skin with laser resurfacing or something that kind of tightens the skin. All right, here's another picture to depict the youthful eye as we were talking about the crease. Uh, if you could see on here that the um, distance between the eyelid margin and the crease is about a third of the distance between the um, eyelid margin and the brow, the bottom of the brow. And as we age, that also, that changes. So I'm gonna give you, um, what this distance is, you can see I just put an arrow there. The distance between the upper eyelid margin and the crease has decreased by quite a bit, and the, di the distance between the eyelid margin and the brow makes up a bigger portion compared to the distance between the lid margin and the upper eyelid crease. So this really, this big distance between the eyelid margin and the brow is quite evident and it just changes what the uh, eye looks like and it makes it look really aged. So we have loose excess skin that folds over. We do have protruding fat. So if you see in the inner corner of the eye, it's nice and crisp on the young eye, the youthful eye. On the aged eye, there's this puffiness that happens in the inner corner of the eye. And that's actually the fat that surrounds the eyeball itself is becoming more loose and being able to be seen, and that's protruding. And then you have a loss of volume under the brow. So if you could see under the brow on the center portion on outside of the eye, you've got a loss of volume and that's that can be addressed with fillers, but more often than not, I try to take the fat that's protruding and I repurpose it by moving it to the area where it's hollow. And I'll show you in another uh, picture, a patient of mine that I did surgery, that you could see that improvement just by doing so. Now then to recap, this is um, a depiction of the aging eye, but I want to point out really the lower eyelid. So I'll show you again here. This is the A-frame deformity I was pointing to earlier. You've got a nice crisp margin. That crease is showing, but as we age, it can retract back and you don't see a crease. 
and you have a loss of volume under the brow, and that is what you see the distance between the margin and that crease has increased on the upper eyelid, which gives us the, away the aging, uh, the aging eye. On the lower eyelid, the distance between the margin of the eye and where the cheek starts is less, but as you age, that distance increases and you've got this crease or what we call a tear trough deforming that forms and it lengthens the position of what the eyelid uh, where the eyelid starts and the cheek starts and it gives us away this aging appearance to the eye. So again, there's loss of volume, there's lengthening that we see of the lower eyelid to the cheek, there's that tear trough deformity, and there's sagging of the lid as well as the skin you can see has lots of wrinkles. Here's anatomy of the lower eyelid, and the reason why I want to point this out before I go into going over surgery itself is that this shows you what can be done with fillers and what can't be done. So as we age, you can see on the left side of the youthful eye, there is there are two ligaments. So the top ligament that you see, which is depicted as A, is called the orbicularis retaining ligament. And the lower one, which is labeled as D, is considered the malar ligament. And these ligaments attach from the bone all the way through the muscle to the skin. And that's what gives us this line that starts to develop as we age. As things loosen, the ligaments are still there, and but everything else sags around it. So you have muscle sagging, you have the, the fat sagging around it, but the ligament is still there. And it creates these deep depressions in the lower eyelid. And if you can try to imagine putting fillers, I cannot put it too deep, otherwise it causes a problem because then it just accentuates the fat that's showing. So it has to be specifically well placed between the skin and the muscle and not into the ligament because otherwise it will just accentuate that fold even more. So this is very tricky to do. You have to do it just right with fillers. And so as this shows more and more, it becomes more um, crucial that the patient has lower eyelid surgery rather than fillers because fillers will not address this well enough. You can cause more problems, especially if the skin is thin. And so that's where surgery comes into play. So uh, that when surgery is done, what we do is we break that ligament. So we release that ligament, which I'll show you in a uh, surgery video here in just a moment. But I release that ligament, that orbicularis retaining ligament, and the arcus marginalis is another name for that area uh, right over the bone. So I release all that, and then I allow the fat that's starting to protrude and cause the bag in our lower eyelid. I, I take that fat and I move it down over the bone, and then I secure it through the skin with this suture that anchors the fat in the right place. And then we also try to release the malar ligament as well. The malar ligament is a little bit harder to do because it's further down into the cheek, but I can do that when I do a facelift procedure. Uh, but more often than not, that malar ligament does not need to be done in most of my patients, but in some older patients who have got that malar festoon or a malar fat pad, um, or malar bag or mound, should I say, then we do have to release that ligament. Okay, so now this comes the fun part. This is uh, what I wanted to show to all of you, which is this is going to be just showing you uh, what I do for upper and lower eyelid surgery. This is a patient that I've done on the table, um, and I'm just going to show you the markings that we've done and then the injection that we do. And this is very easy to do in the office, so those patients who are kind of concerned um, about doing this in the operating room. Don't be scared about this. This is really easy. We do put shields over the eyes and you can see when I do this that you see a color to the eye that looks green. That's the eye shield that's protecting the eye. I do this under sedation and patients are usually very comfortable through the whole case. The upper and the lower eyelid surgery can be done in about three hours um, and that can be done in the office as long as they're uh, have a good airway. If I have a patient who is just afraid of just being awake at any point, then I will suggest that they have this under general anesthesia. But for the most part, I've had a lot of success with just doing this in the office and patients actually recover faster and 
their, um, their recovery from the surgery in terms of how long it takes for them to recover is faster when we do this under sedation rather, rather than under general anesthetic. So uh, that is a plus to do it that way. So here I go. Here's an injection. This is sped up, just showing you what the injection is like. And that just causes a little bubble of the skin. And then we just lift that skin. So we're lifting the skin up and I'm just removing it very, very finely, and I'm just taking it over the muscle. So it's all only skin. I leave the muscle down, and then you can see that I'm just dissecting that last portion at the very end. I really want it very sharp and nice and precise. The incisions were already marked before doing the surgery, and then we just, I'm just doing a little cautery here to stop any bleeding. Uh, so if any of you are squeamish about blood, hope, just hopefully I, I try to cut out as much as I can of this, of the belly portions. I'm just injecting the fat there right now and then I'm cauterizing it because we don't want it to bleed because that can cause a bleeding underneath and relate, go to hematoma. So now I'm just closing the incision. I use a suture that um, uh, has to be removed but it is on the outside so you can't really even see that um, and it's kind of buried in. Now this is where I'm doing the lower eyelid surgery. I know this is a little sped up, but I'm, I'm doing this so that you guys can see all parts of it. Of course, it's not this fast. Um, I wish I was this fast, <laughs> uh, but no. Um, and then this is the part where I'm just exposing the fat of the lower eyelid. I don't know if you could see this, a little bloody, but here's the exposed lower eyelid fat pad. And then I'm exposing the bone on the surface and I've released that ligament that I talked about earlier. Once it's released, then I take that fat and now I'm using the suture and I'm putting a suture through it. And then I'm gonna secure it through and underneath and securing it right over the bone, but it's secured through the skin. And we put this knot on the outside and I take that knot out at one week. And it's simple there. Now this I do just to remove any excess skin in the lower eyelid. And that is very simply just removed right underneath the eyelid margin. It leaves a little tiny incision just under the lashes. And then I just literally glue that closed. There's no tension on it. And then we just glue it closed. So hopefully you can see that. And that's it on that. All right. So before I go on, um, if you do have any questions, feel free. If you have any questions about the surgery itself, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. This next part, I'm gonna just talk about fillers versus surgery because with the lower eyelids, um, there are some patients who can have fillers and are a good candidate for it. Um, I, as I explained earlier, if there's a lot of hollowing, then that's great for fillers. If they start, If you start to see a lot of deep depressions, which I'll show you on another patient, then that's when surgery is more appropriate. In this younger patient, she just has more hollowing and dark circles. And so hollowing, hollowing is easily addressed with using fillers because fillers put volume in the area and just fill out the area where that's depressed, okay? So this, is, this was done using filler. This was also done using filler, and this is immediately after injection. And, and you can see how it's important for fillers, it can be done to help with dark circles. And even though she's younger, she's starting to show some aging signs around the eyes and these dark circles. And just by putting fillers, it can soften those dark circles. Uh, and this was done immediately after we took the picture, so you could see right after the injection. Um, this is uh, also another younger patient, but she's just starting to show these bags and the dark circles as well. So just hiding it with fillers is appropriate. At some point though, as the bags become more prominent, that's when I tell patients, look, you're gonna come at some point, at some point down the road, we are going to have to uh, do surgery to remove the fat and put it down into the area where they're hollow underneath. So that's where it can take care of the hollowing as well as take care of the bags that are showing. Okay, so this is a picture just showing you of upper eyelid surgery. I'll, I'll go over a lower eyelid surgery in a moment, but this is a uh, gentleman that had uh, upper eyelid surgery and you can see the before and after results uh, very clearly that the skin is loose and it's hanging over the lashes. And just by removing that, we can 
open up the eyes. It's that distance, as I said before, that crease is more crisp. The distance between the crease and the lid margin is now visible when you can see that distance is uniform throughout. This is before and after. Now the outside edge of the uh, brow here, where we call what I call lateral hooding, is taken away from the surgery by, by removing that loose skin. There is still some hooding there, and that further hooding is related to the brow dropping. And so um, in order to address that completely, we would have, have had to do a brow lift, which we didn't do in this case, uh, because the brow uh, incision would have to be placed in the hair there. And um, as you can see, there's not much hair to hide uh, for a brow lift for this patient. Okay, so this is before and after um, upper eyelid surgery. This is another patient before and upper after eyelid surgery, and you can see all the loose skin as well as the puffiness in the inner corner was taken away just from doing the eyelid surgery. And then from the side, so you could see that gap, the distance um, between the upper eyelid crease and the lashes, you can see bef uh, before and after where there was no distance between the crease and the eyelid margin on the left. And on the right, you open, we open that up with eyelid surgery. And then from the side, so you can see that skin hanging over the lashes and then from the side where it's opened up and we've got this crisp, uh, nicely defined crease of the upper eyelid. Here's a lower eyelid surgery patient, as you can see before and after, where we took the fat, and you can see where the fat is showing um, the bags, which make her look tired, and the bags are then moved down into the area where it's hollow, and you can see a smooth transition. That's our goal, smooth transition between the lower eyelid and the cheek, and there shouldn't be any distinction between the, the lid uh, lower eyelid and the cheek. It should, just should flow right into the cheek. And that's a youthful look to the eyelids. This is before and after again from the side three quarters. And from the other three quarters, so you can see that distinction there. Here's a before and after. Um, and on this patient, she also had a lot of excess skin. So we did some CO2 laser resurfacing and took out the excess skin as well. We also moved the fat down. And so you can see how smooth that transition is after the procedure when we're able to move the fat down into the area where it's hollow. Um, under her left eye, which is on your right, when you see, take a look at this, where she's kind of hollow and there's the bag there. And now the the transition to on the right hand side, the after photo, and that smoothness there uh, that with the hollowing gone. This is upper and lower eyelid surgery. Again, you can see the distance for the eyelid crease between the eyelid margin um, and the crease itself, and that's been ex exposed. You get some more improvement there. The eyes look more open and alert. And then the lower eyelid surgery, uh, the fat was moved down into the area where she was hollow. And, um, and you can see where she's got this extra crease that goes from the inside of the eye down into the cheek. That is called the malar septum, and that's from that malar ligament that I talked about earlier. There's two ligaments. One was released, which is the orbicularis retaining ligament, and the malar ligament was released in the inside corner of the eye. So that gave us that really nice uh, transition. And then here's that before and after from the three quarters view. So you could take a look at that. This is an upper and lower eyelid surgery case as well. Uh, and you can see this is one I wanted to point out because if you do notice um, from before and after, she's actually hollow in the center portion. And there's that um, sort of an A-frame A deformity. If I just took out the fat on the inside corner um, of her eyes, then she would even be more hollow. So we smoothed out by taking away the excess skin. But then I also took the fat on the inside corner of her eye from the upper eyelid, and I moved it to the center portion of her eye of her upper eyelid just over the pupil of her eye, which is you know the opening of the eye there in the middle. And that allows you a smooth transition where it doesn't look where you have an A-frame deformity, okay? So without that, 
she would have had an A-frame deformity if I just took out skin and removed a little of that fat that was starting to show. So that's where we, the same thing as what I do for the lower eyelids, I take the fat and I move it to where I need it to take care of any hollowing. And then the lower eyelids, we did the same thing, which is we moved the fat down into the area where it was hollow, and we did take out some uh, loose skin that was there. So that is a good, youthful eye before and after. And then this is a picture from the three quarters view, so you can see how that looks. This is a, an Asian patient um, where we took upper and lower uh, we address the upper eyelid loose skin, which you'll see on the three, on the uh, oblique view um, how that smoothed out. And then the lower eyelid, uh, this technique was actually done via open, meaning I made an incision and I opened it out completely from the uh, skin and muscle rather than taking an incision on the inside of the eye that you saw earlier from the, um, the video where I showed the lower eyelid surgery. And then this is before and after, so you could see where the bads are taken care of and from the side so you can see where she doesn't look so tired anymore, the loose skin of the upper eyelid and the bags and the hollowing in the lower eyelid. And there you have it. Um, in recap for upper, uh, sorry, uh, in recap, the difference between fillers and eyelid surgery is that fillers can address areas of hollowing. So it'd be area, addressing areas of uh, A-frame deformity in the upper eyelid or in the lower eyelid where there's just a bit of hollowing and dark circles that can be addressed really well. But as you start to see very deep bags, uh, very prominent bags and a deep crevice underneath, it's very hard to address that um, with fillers alone because the eyes will look very puffy. So the way to take care of that is we take the fat and we repurpose it and move it down to fill out the area where it's hollow um, and, and address that by also um, taking care of the our, our orbicularis retaining ligament. So we splice that. And so we allow that good transition between the lower eyelid and cheek to return to where we were when we were younger. Um, and then uh, in summary too, uh, that upper and lower eyelid surgery is a very easy procedure to do in the office. I know a lot of patients who get a little worried about doing this, but most of my patients don't remember. They remember certain parts of the surgery, uh, but are otherwise really comfortable and um, don't remember what was done during the case. It's, it flies by quickly, and uh, usually patients share with me that, um, that they would have done it the same way again uh, in that manner. So there you have it. That's upper and lower eyelid surgery. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to, to enjoy the video that I prepared for you so you could see what the surgery looks like. Um, and sorry if any of you are squeamish about blood in this case. Uh, so with that, I am going to change it now to uh, the Q&A uh, session. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna go back to this webinar here. So did anybody have questions? I know that uh, I saw some, uh, some questions here. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh my God, I'm dying. Yes. Um, I hope that wasn't too gory. Uh, I know that uh, that was a little, it could have been a little bit on the bloody side, but I was hoping to show what the surgery looks like. Um, you know, of course, there's a little bit of bleeding during the surgery and we uh, do everything we can to um, minimize this and cauterize the areas. So a question was brought up here, what is the downtime? So uh, I'm going to type the answer, but also um, uh, address that here. Majority of the downtime is in the first week. So a lot of the bruising and swelling goes down within that time frame. Uh, but I usually tell my patients that if you really are looking for your result to look good, where you nobody has any clue that you've had surgery, uh, you want to um, you want to give yourself at least a month. So most of my patients will say, you know, yeah, I would say mo you know, particularly for my uh, male patients, guys, they don't have the luxury of using makeup. It, otherwise they would look um, ridiculous. So a lot of my male patients will say it literally took them a month before they felt like they were good to be presentable and out and about and that nobody had any clue. Um, I 
preface that because some people recover faster than others if we're just doing lower eyelid surgery and it's just a repositioning of the uh, fat and it's not removing too much skin and they don't have any other blood pressure issues or any health issues, then they recover really quickly. And so my younger patients, of course, do much better with this and they recover within a week to 10 days. My older patients can take up to a month before they look presentable. So uh, give yourself social downtime of one month. Um, so that's that. And then another question came up, at what age can you get eyelid surgery? So I don't have a particular age necessarily with eyelid surgery. Eyelid surgery really, particularly with lower eyelid surgery, I can do this as early as uh, somebody in their 20s. So you can have, um, you can have signs of aging already, which is those lower eyelid bags. Some people are born with it. Uh, they, maybe they'll tell me, you know, my mom or my dad already had bags. Like I see that and I know where I'm going and I can see that I have bags and they have dark circles and they're, it's very hard for them to cover it. Well, then eyelid surgery is appropriate for my younger patients for the lower eyelids. Upper eyelids take some time. It may uh, be not until your 30s or 40s before you start seeing the sagging skin or the loss of volume or the prominent um, bags that you're seeing on the inside corner of the eyes. Um, some patients will, you know, I can have Asian eyelids that start to show that not, not necessarily with the eyelid crease, but they're just starting to see a little fold of skin that we can easily do an eyelid surgery there, or there's something that can be done right under the brow to lift the eyelids as well. Um, so that can be well hidden with that incision. But again, with eyelid surgery, upper eyelid surgery recovery with that is usually about one week. Uh, and most of my patients can go back to work within one week for upper eyelid surgery. Lower eyelid surgery, I would give yourself a month. Upper eyelid surgery is much quicker and simpler and easier to do. As you saw the picture and the video, it's removing skin and then uh, closing the skin. Uh, and I took out just a little bit of fat on the inside corner, but otherwise it's straightforward. And so because of that, upper eyelid surgery is a faster procedure, faster recovery, and um, you shouldn't expect too long of a downtime with that. Okay, one other question here. I have had filler under my eyes for years. How long should I wait before considering surgery? All right, so this is, um, you know, when you've had filler under the eyes, it's hard to assess with the filler there. So sometimes we have to wait for the filler to go down quite a bit before we can tell. Um, but also if you're starting to see that with the fillers, your eyes are looking more puffy rather than rusted. So maybe the hollowing is gone, the dark circles are gone, but now the eyelid, the eyes themselves look still very puffy then it might be time to have eyelid surgery. So that's when we want to dissolve the filler so we can really assess where the filler is um, hiding the area of hollowing and what is what our bags, uh, where the bags are and how present, how prominent they are. And that's when we can address that with doing surgery. So how long should you wait? It's really up to you as to whether you think um, you're starting to show a lot of puffiness that can't be hidden by fillers. And in that case, then we should dissolve the fillers. Dissolving the fillers uh, is really quick. It takes uh, one to two injections, and we have to give about uh, three to four days between of these dissolving agents before we can assess and say, okay, now we're ready to do surgery. And then uh, determining how deep the pocket is or the area of hollowing that we have to address. Um, I don't know if you could see in this video uh, my eyes, and you could probably take a look at how my bags are starting to show in this lower eyelid. It's not quite prominent yet. I've done a really good job of my makeup today, so hopefully that doesn't show too bad, but I do have a bit of hollowing and then a little bit of hollow, uh, sorry, a little bit of bags that you could start to see, uh, and then some hollow underneath. So if you really want to check, you can tilt your chin down, look up, and you can see where you've got bags and where you've got hollowing. And if the filler is filling the area pretty well and you've got a nice transition where you've got lower eyelids to cheek without a area of hollowing, then you still might be good with fillers. But if you're starting to put see the filler 
and it's still not covering that area of hollowing and the bags are still prominent, then that's where um, at that point it would be a good idea to consider surgery. So I hope that answered that question. I know that was a long-winded answer, but uh, it was meant to give you some more information about uh, eyelid surgery and the distinction between eyelid surgery and fillers. Would you recommend fat transfer? Here's another question, sorry for those who are still listening. Would you recommend fat transfer if you dissolve my filler? I am hollow. So uh, fat transfer is if you're hollow and um, uh, the only problem that you have is hollowing, then fat transfer can be an option for you if you don't have enough bags to take care of the hollowing. And so that hollowing, can be addressed with fat that we take from another part of the body. Usually I take it from the belly and I um, spin that fat. So I harvest it by liposuctioning the fat. I spin the fat and then we inject it back with a little bit of um, PRP, which is blood that's uh, uh, harvested and we harvest and, and screen it just for the platelet-rich plasma. And that acts as a good agent to really stimulate the fat to stay really well in that area under the eyes. So yes, so fat transfer is a great option for areas of hollowing that's not just, not where there's no bags and it's just more hollowing. Um, and I do have to dissolve the filler before we do fat transfer, of course, so that we uh, have a good assessment of how much hollowing we're dealing with. We don't wanna mix fat and uh, filler together because as the filler goes away, more hollowing will show up and then we'll have to go back and add more fat to the area. Thank you for all your questions, everybody. Um, I want to just pull up a poll before we end. Um, I guess this was, uh, that's one question here. This question is just to see uh, how if, if everyone is uh, listening here, what is the recovery time like for eyelid surgery? So I'm just going to launch this poll and see what you guys have answered for this. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. And so uh, that's correct. It's one month of social downtime. Um, and then a third of you actually said one to two weeks, which is true with the upper eyelid surgery. So that's actually, a, sorry about that. That's um, a little trick question, but it's one to two weeks of social downtime for the upper eyelid. For the lower eyelid, it does take about one month. Um, so that's the amount of time that you wanna give yourself for the recovery. All right. Last question for all of you, and this is just to see uh, what your considerations are for tuning in today to this Q&A. Why are you considering eyelid surgery? It could be eye bags, it could be some excess skin around the eyes, maybe some people have too many wrinkles, and so there's all these reasons to either have eyelid surgery or to have fillers um, to the eyes. So I, I really want to just see what you guys are here for and how I can best answer your questions about consider if you're considering eyelid surgery. All right, I'm gonna end the poll now. And so um, majority of you said hooding over the eyes. So that's the upper eyelid uh, surgery. And um, hopefully that I have addressed, I've addressed this uh, concern with this webinar today and hopefully you've gotten something out of the video which was sped up a little quicker than, the, than what I do it but gives you an idea of what I do for upper eyelid surgery and for the hooding over the eyes. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Oh and loose skin too. Yes. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, and feel free to uh, send us an email. You can contact me uh, via info at facesbydrt.com or if you want to schedule your consultation or appointment, you can go to our website at www.facesbydrt.com and you can submit your request for an appointment with us for a consultation. Uh, the other way to contact us is to go to our Instagram page at Faces by DRT. And when you go to our Instagram page, please follow me. I'd love to hear back from all of you and to keep in 
contact with you. Um, we like to post great content on there at all times, and we would love to hear your feedback as well. And on our Instagram page, you'll be able to find our profile information, which has um, the link to how to, in, uh, to uh, register for a, um, an appointment with us. And you can make your appointment through the appointment scheduler through that link on our Instagram as well. Thank you as always. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope you found this information um, very uh, educational. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great Monday.